Like the ebook is Paul Chia. Hi, hello, and welcome. It's Sean O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School. Um, today I wanted to talk about a person who gets a bit of a bad rap during the Ulster cycle of Irish mythology. And that person is Brickrew. So um, over at the Irish Pagan School for the last two months, I've been delving deep into the Ulster cycle of Irish mythology. So if we kind of look at the, the ancient kind of lore and stories of Ireland, you know, it's kind of academically kind of collected into four different cycles. So there's the mythological cycle dealing with the Irish gods, the two of the Danon, the Fair Bullock, the Fomorians. Then we have the Ulster cycle, which is the rivalry between Queen Maeve of Connacht and um, Concover of Ulster, culminating in the Tom Bonconia, the Cattle Raider Cooley. Um, when we move after that, we have the Leinster cycle, which is the story of Fionn and the Fianna. And then we move into the fourth cycle, which is the cycle of kings, which is more um, a list or an... Uh, like it's also referred to as, as the annals, really, as this kind of long list of all of these various people who we can track more towards the history of Ireland as opposed to the mythology of Ireland. Um, so we're dealing with the Ulster cycle when we're looking for brick room. And I have been, as I said, straight in with the Irish Pagan School for the last two months teaching an introduction really to the names of many people from Ulster, but then also many people from Connacht. Um, the, the heroes, the kings, the druids, etc. that's all involved. But what you do find is that brick room turns up and brick room gets a bad rap. And so much so that during the class, as I was teaching it, people were like, well, why did they not just get rid of Brick Root? Why did someone just not like do him in, you know, or why was he constantly allowed to kind of get away with what he was doing? Or was Brick Root's kind of perceived mischievousness or kind of manipulative kind of trickster nature in violation of the laws of Irish hospitality? And so they're really, really good questions. And I absolutely loved kind of having the, those perspectives provided because as I've always said, I love a good question. It provides an opportunity to, to consider what you know, but then also try and see what you don't know, what you don't understand and to kind of follow your thought process to explore the lore and to kind of question things a little bit further for yourself until you find an answer you're satisfied with. Um, now, some of us will never find an answer we're fully satisfied with because, you know, we end up following the cycles of the lore and revisiting those kind of perceptions again and again, which is a healthy thing to do. It's always good to revisit our perceptions. So Brick Room, the initial perception that most people have is that he is a trickster. He is a, he's actually referred to in the lore as a vile tongued or sharp tongued or venom tongued individual um, because he's constantly kind of questioning or kind of manipulating people by kind of talking and setting people against themselves or set, setting people against each other in rivalries and conquests. And um, we can see this most notably in the story that bears his name, which is Fled Rickru, Fled Rickrin, or the Feast of Brickru. And um, in this, not to kind of read the entire story for you, but essentially um, Brickru is a brewer which I will clarify a little bit more later on why that's actually important and why we should maybe reconsider our perceptions of Brickroot because of that fact. But he makes an entire feast hall, you know, to rival the, the feast hall in Tara. It's actually described as to copy the feast hall in Tara and then do better than it, specifically to invite all of the Ullad or the Ultonians um, with Concover, the, the, the ruling kind of Red Branch warriors and their wives and everything to bring them to a feast. Um, at the feast, though, he kind of talks to each of the three great heroes, Lerbujok, Conal Kernock, and Kukulin, and kind of asks them, well, sure, are you not the best warrior in all of Ulster? Surely you should be the one who gets this prize champion's portion that I have, this, this amazing kind of pig, which has been fed only the best of things for the entire year. It had, like, you know, and he lists actually out yeah, what it was fed, like, you know, particular meals or... Um, Gosh, I don't have that in my brain at the moment. But, you know, he goes by season what this particular pig was fed. And it was the best of the best. Like it had mead to drink instead of water. It had milk in like, you know, spring, summer instead of this. It had the finest kind of nuts through the harvest period. You know, it's all of this kind of this is going to be the best pig ever because of how it's been fed. And surely this champion's portion, as well as a whole lot of wealth and gifts and recognition should go to whoever's the best. And so he goes to each of these three heroes, tells them they're the best and tells them like, you know, really, you should be asking for this champion's portion, therefore setting up the conflict within 
the the feast hall that he has arranged. And so when it comes to awarding this, like the, the meat of this pig and all of the stuff that goes with it, the three lads, Lair Bujok, Colin Kernock and Cúcullin get into a full on scrap. So much so that Concover and Fergus McRock have to step in, like physically restrain them and tell them to get the fuck out of the feast hall um, so that they can fix the mess they made. Of course, when they're outside the feast hall, Bricker goes and speaks to each of their wives, complimenting them on their virtue, on their grace, on their kindness, on their intellect and their beauty. And then saying, like, you know, really, it, you should be the first person to walk back into that hall before any of the other women, like, you know, because you're the best woman in all of Ulster. And he says this to the three wives of the three heroes, which then leads to an almost sprint race between the women to be the first to get back in um, and as they're trying to get back in they call to their husbands who are already inside and demand that they they set off into a scrap again to make sure that they are the one who comes in eventually it leads to Cullen lifting up the entire wall of the thing so Emer can walk in and when he lets it go it topples the entire kind of feasting hall so I am essentially I'm telling you the full story of Fled Bricker here. Um, it, it goes on. The, there's a war of words with the women. The women actually kind of get into it themselves, and they're they're really kind of like scathing each other out with the, the with the the power of their intellect and with their words. And so eventually, it comes to a very unsatisfactory conclusion where they agree that no one here can make the judgment, and that's when it goes to the next stage. They'll have to go to Maeve and Aliel and Connacht. So Brickrew is centered in this story for having set up multiple conflicts between these very powerful people and dangerous people within his society. And that's then what garners him the name as this sharp-tongued, manipulative trickster. Um, and it's almost like he's, he's doing it just for his own entertainment to watch how people like rival against each other and scrap against each other. But when we kind of explore Brickrew in context of his role in society, his position within society and his place in the very martial society of the Ulster King Con Concover's court at the time, things take on a bit of a different perspective. Now, I wish I could teach an entire class just on Brickrew, but I don't know if there is enough context to do it, which is why I'm actually going here and kind of talking it out with you. So Brickrew is a brewer. A brewer is... Um, a uniquely recognized position within the farming caste of ancient Ireland. So you had like the, the Tuas, which were the tribes, and then at the center top, this kind of serenimit or free, like ruling caste in essence. Um, you had your chieftain, you had your, your, your champion warriors, you had your fila, your bard, your top druid, etc. cetera. Um, but at the head of the farming kind of caste was a brewer, and a brewer had to be independently wealthy. A brewer had to be able to have such a vast herd of cattle that if anyone came to their home, which had to be positioned at a crossroad of three roads, um, at least three roads, the anyone who came to their house, the brew was obliged, obligated under the law of the land to provide hospitality. Now, hospitality wasn't just, hey, hi, welcome, come on in and like, you know, check out my place. It was a guarantee of safety. It was security and protection as if they were family while they're in your home and then it's also providing for their food and their food and, and drink needs like in fact we have a record from the law tracks that a free man in hospitality could claim no more than six pints um, of ale so there's a there's a large amount of wealth that needs to be established there that anyone and everyone who would walk up to a brewer's hall would never go without you know and it was a very very big deal but also a brewer's hall was considered neutral ground. There was no like loyalties within a brewer's hall. Under the auspices of hospitality, there could be no conflict within the hall because everyone is considered to be equally accepted and respected. And um, so much so that a brewer didn't need to send people of his own kind of like collected, his own collected warriors or defense people to a call from a tour. If, if the king or chieftain of a tour were to gather up a force for a raid or a conflict aren't let out at all. Any of the people who follow or work for or owe allegiance to the brewer don't have to go. So the brewer is this independently wealthy individual who is specifically positioned within society to provide for those who would come and those in need 
but then also to maintain that neutrality no matter what. So when we take that information, we get a slightly different view of Brickru because Con Cover to become the King of Ulster, um, Fergus McGrath was King of Ulster at the time. He fancied Con Cover's mother, Nessa, and, you know, she agreed to be with him for a year if he gave the rule of Con of Ulster to her son, Con Cover, for a year, which he did. But then Con Cover, following his mom's plan, was, OK, you take all of the wealth from every second person and you give it to the other person. So essentially, it, Concover created this 1% of wealthy individuals, this top tier of people who, you know, gained significantly under his rule. So that by the end of the year, he was kind of re-elected. Or when Fergus was like, listen, I'll take back the kingship now, all the people in Ulster, all these wealthy individuals who've done well under Concover's rule are like, no, no, we'll just keep Concover instead because he's doing well for us. <clears throat> what? was installed then within Aon Mako was Concover's view of Ulster, was his view of a martial Ulster, this, the establishment of the Red Branch Knights, like the, the Machrit, which were the young nobles before they could uh, were of an age to become a warrior. They gathered and practiced warrior feats in, in games together. You know, it's this that Kukulan ends up coming, or well, a young Satanta comes into and ha finds a scrap with amongst the young lads. And it is this very martial, very warrior heavy cast, which is why we end up with these three rival champions in Ulster. So Prikru gets a bad rap. He set up as this person who is constantly kind of needling other people in order to just set them against each other for the fun. But when we look at the greater context of his position within society and the, the view of the Ulster cycle itself, everyone points at Kukulan and says he's a hero but he's a self-serving rage monster who is manipulated by the other adults around him. Everyone looks at Conal Kernock and says he's a hero, but Conal Kernock himself professes to never go to sleep unless he is the head of a Connachtman freshly slain underneath him. Lord Bujok is said to be the third hero, but the list of his feats and running people over his chariots and kind of skewering people with his spears, everywhere you look, all of these people who are said to be heroes are actually self-serving violent examples of the worst, most toxic masculine or patriarchal traits that we have in that society. <clears throat> so Bricker's kind of position almost fulfills an element of questioning the power structure. He's outside of that power structure because of his, no no well, his neutrality and his financial independence. He's independently wealthy, irrespective of Concover. He doesn't owe him an allegiance. He doesn't owe him for his own wealth. So he's able to be secure enough in, within his position with society to have the freedom to question the power structures that are actually there. This role is most commonly seen in, in bards where they were perform, perform satires against other people who you know, were not living up to the proper rules or the proper kind of culture of society at the time. But we don't have a record of any bards holding Concover accountable, what we do have is Brickru challenging the status quo on things. One of the other greatest examples of this it comes later on from the wooing of Emer. When Gukulan, who has been allocated the champion's portion, you're the best warrior and all the rest of it, he goes off and woos Emer, um, and he brings Emer back to be his wedded wife. But the rule of the society that was set up by Concover was that every woman who marries in his rulership would sleep with him on the first night of the wedding so that every woman would be his wife first and then they get to be the wife of their husbands. Um, and so that was the well-established protocol that everyone kind of agreed with. So Concover had this status of first night. Um, and so when Cucullin finally comes back, having gone through all of his terrible labors, all of his kind of gaining feats and all the rest of it to woo Emer and then to save her from her manipulative father and escape back into Ulster, he arrives back and he's like, finally, it's great. I, I, I've done that. But it's Bricku who's like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, it's a shame she has to sleep her first night here with Con Cover. Now, of course, it's seen as like, oh, well, he's stirring shit. Or is he actually just reminding what is the cultural structure that has been established? Is he actually calling out, well, this, this, is, this is the rule. This is the way you've decided to structure your society. And he's reminding that. And of course, Cullen goes off on one and Concover for one of the first times in his life is afraid of his life, 
afraid for his life. So eventually they come to a, re a re reconciliation where Emer will sleep in the same bed as Concover, but with Fergus McCroft and Cuthbert the Druid in between them, so that eventually, like, you know, she her virtue can be maintained and secured, and then she can go to Cuchulain's bed, like, on, well, anyway, I won't kind of, toxic parts of the culture, this kind of position of women, as much as Emer is recognized as a very intelligent individual who then earns her own position within the female power structure of Ulster, there is still that element that women are property way back when in that time frame. So difficult conversations, but it's Brickrew who reminds people of what their structure of society is. And he calls it out what he sees, what he observes. He's like, well, this is just the way it's always been arranged and they have to find some way to work around it. When eventually it comes to the break um, in Ulster, because with the tragedy that is the story of Deirdre and the Sons of Ushnach, um, because of a betrayal of trust by Concover, Fergus McGrath, who gave his guarantee of protection to Deirdre and the Sons of Ushnach, is manipulated away from that protection of them so that Concover can have them slain, have them killed. And of course, when Fergus arrives back, it's an absolute horror show, and it leads to this split, the civil war almost, where Concover is kind of put on the back foot by Fergus and his 3,000, um, but Fergus then leaves and goes into Connacht. Interestingly enough, when we look at this, <clears throat> Fergus kind of represents an older, almost more notable power structure or noble power structure in that the will of his people comes first. When they decide that Concover is going to be kept as king, he's like, okay, fair enough. You know, when Satanta as a child is being allocated, all these people who are going to teach him like to be a judge or to teach him how to be a poet or to teach him how to be a thing. Fergus is the one who's to teach him to be disciplined, to teach him kind of respect and honor. So when we have this significant breach of protocol between Concover and Fergus, it's not unsurprising that Brickrew knows where his loyalty lies. Brickrew knows the type or the society that he prefers to be part of, which is why he also joins Fergus in exile. Um, so there's a lot to be said for Brickrew. Oh, yeah. Eventually it comes to an end for Brickrew. And that when the Fionvanach and the Dunculnia, the white and the brown bull, are having their own conflict in the Rathcrohan complex, all of the warriors are like, well, we need someone to observe that. We need to know how that element of the Tom Bokulia resolves. And they send out Brickrew. And so Brickrew is kind of forced into this position of observation of a titanic clash between these horrible, monstrous bulls which is an age-old kind of transmigration of two spirits right the way back down. Different story from another time, I'm sure. But these two bulls are going at it and they, they trample Brickroot to death. And that is the end of, of our poor Brickroot. But when we look again to the structure of the story, and that was the, the purpose really of the classes that I taught the ancient heroes and villains of Ulster, and then just recently ancient heroes and villains of Connacht, trying to identify who are the heroes in these stories. Who are the villains in the stories? And what a lot of the times it shook out as there isn't really, even though we're pointed at Cucullin and told that's a hero, we're pointed at Conal Kernick, that's a hero. You know, they also perform very villainous acts. They also perform very terrible things, um, very toxic things from a point of view of the martial culture, but then also their attitude towards women in many cases. So there is a lot of difficulty around that. And so when we look at history being written by the victors or these tales being told and they're telling us one particular thing, but then when we actually analyze it a little bit further for ourselves and question what's being presented to us in the story, the people who are being lauded, oh, this is the great person for all their great deeds. They're actually not the greatest person in the tale at all, but the person who's being hard done by in the story, the person we're being told is, you know, a trickster, a manipulator, a sharp tongued, is mean tongued, you know, he's the one, Brickrew is the one who gets a lot of bad rep. But if the story is turned on its head and the heroes in the stories are actually the villains, then is it possible the person we're being told is the a bad guy throughout the entire tale is actually not? Is it possible that Brickrew is providing this counterpoint to the narrative, this different perspective of direct kind of conversation or direct questioning of what is being presented around them. 
So I have many thoughts on this and I've shared a lot of it in this and probably been rambling on for quite a while. If you have found it interesting and you want to know more of this, please do check out the other videos. Do the like and subscribe thing if you really want to maintain content with the channel. If you want to know more about all of this, as I said, the Irish Pagan School has classes taught by me on this very, very topic. But uh, also, if you have your own personal perceptions of Brick Crew, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'd be very, very delighted. So do jump down into the comment section if you're inspired to do so. Tell me what you think of Brick Crew. And until next time, look after yourself, take care, and so on. Goodbye.